Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about the 1972 film Shaft's Big Score, which was the sequel to the 1971 surprise hit Shaft, directed by Gordon Parks and starring Richard Roundtree as the now seminal black exploitation hero. Uh, Warner Brothers Archives put the film out on Blu ray just in time uh, for the new release of Tim Story's Shaft, which uh, uh, is the second iteration of Samuel Jackson as uh, Shaft, and uh, the film has flopped horribly at the box office. <laughs> so it might be the last one we'll see. Um, Darn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Shaft's big score is interesting because since the first film, directed by Gordon Parks, uh, made so much money, he was able to come back and make the sequel with twice the budget, and you can tell. Uh, and it doesn't really feel like a black exploitation film because of that, but the plot is the complicated nonsense. convoluted nonsense it's nonsense <laughs> okay let's try to okay break down the plot so shaft shaft richard roundtree is uh romantically involved with a woman whose brother owns an insurance company but who's also like running a numbers scheme Got so it. he's in trouble with like mafioso type people. Yes, but but her brother is a good guy, but his partner is not. His partner has uh, become like steeped in debt, I guess. Steeped in debt. So Richard Roundtree's girlfriend's brother is killed because his partner doesn't want to be indebted to him and wants to take whatever money, like the uh, the cash out of the safe. He wants the cash because he owes one of these mafioso types a bunch of money. And for some reason, Shaft feels obligated to... Assist. Like, assist. He's doing a lot more than assisting. I mean, he's gone after the bad guy. Yeah, and so he, he becomes put in a precarious situation because he's between the police and, like, these mafiosos. Is that... That's kind of it. That's it. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's mm -hmm. overly complicated for what seems to be... Uh, a pretty basic story. I mean, it's a very common storyline. Oh, but so you, but you were saying that it doesn't feel like a black exploitation film. Yeah. So I mean, so let's start off. I did not like this movie. Um, <laughs> well, no, 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 no. We need to start with the score. So Isaac Hayes, of course, wrote the uh, famous uh, Shaft track, and it's not on this film because he had a falling out with director Gordon Parks. Uh, so there's a different opening song. The opening, so the only part of this movie I liked was the opening song. Which has some good lines. Which has some really funny lines. I would suggest uh, looking that up and listening to it. Um, but the cold open is really cold. Like, it just is not engaging at all. Well, and then the, the man that's about to die, the, the brother, is, does not seem like he's in danger at all. <laughs> yeah, he, he doesn't know he's in danger, so he's just like flopping about. Like, no, he does know. He calls his tries to call his sister. You're right. He doesn't have a fucking chat. And then that's right. And then yes, he's like, yes. tell her to get home and lock the door. Oh yes. So even knowing all that, he's very like flat, and it's mm -hmm. just. Uh, I thought this would be fun, just knowing what to expect from black exploitation films, which we're kind of gearing up around then. Um, and to be fair, maybe it's the you know it doesn't feel like black exploitation. Gordon Parks was black, the director, and I would make a very superficial argument that the black directors of black exploitation films kind of had a different feel to them. So I didn't know that, and knowing that, it uh, I was thinking while while I was watching it that. Um, they seem to have a little more care in how the characters are being treated because traditionally in these films... Well, because the N-word isn't used. The N-word isn't used. Because uh, I know you haven't seen Black Caesar, which is directed by Larry Clark, who's white, and stars Fred Williamson. You know, that has a different feeling altogether to the... Sure. Well, and every other black exploitation film I've seen is uh, much more problematic than this film is. And I do feel like the issues... This doesn't feel like a black exploitation film. I, I don't feel like the issue of race is brought up enough. I don't think that the black characters are exploited no, to the degree that one would expect. In fact, what I noticed in this is more of like a homophobic uh, angle because it looks somebody's get, somebody gets called a fag for having a small gun, and uh, the main villain, the mafioso, the white guy 
It was played by a guy named Joseph Mascolo, who's playing a guy named Mascala, <laughs> uh, who is very effete and. Uh, yeah, for mo for seventy five percent of the film, I assumed this character was gay, and all of a sudden he has a girlfriend and yeah, he, who he's making out with. But at that point, when we see his girlfriend, his demeanor changes yeah, significantly. Yes, like he goes from being like, "I had broke down." He reminds me of Liberace playing the clarinet. Yeah, to like like a mafioso type guy. Like his voice changes, mm -hmm. his outfit changes, seemingly out of nowhere. The rest of the time, he's playing a clarinet in his very homosexually designed interior design. It's very Liberace. I, I, I was getting Kevin Spacey slash Tom Wilkinson vibes from him. That works too. So, yeah, the, the film is not... So because it's not delivering the tropes I would expect in a black exploitation film, then we're just left with the production value, the, the writing, and the acting. Mm -hmm. So the production value is high because, like you mentioned, the budget's double, so it's obvious. But the writing is terrible, and the acting is terrible. So Richard Browntree is not a good actor. I don't think he has much screen presence. Well, he seems, He's not the most attractive man. He seems really bored to me. Sure, but that could be it. He's just not very appealing on screen, certainly not to play this, like... You know, I mean, his character is supposed to be a ladies' man and irresistible and almost like a James Bond type. Yeah. yeah. And he does not, Richard Roundtree does not deliver. He doesn't that. have any good lines. There are no good lines. Uh, the, I mean, I can't even recall. The one, like, explicitly racial moment was when the white cop challenges him and he's like, I want my, co I'd, I'd like some coffee, black. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are a lot of lines that don't necessarily fit what's happening. And then knowing that the music... The soundtrack, definitely. The soundtrack it. may have switched up at the last minute because of Isaac Hayes. Mm -hmm. Who does have a song on there called Type Thing. Um, but, not but knowing that, I, I, the, the, the music is very disjointed in this mm -hmm. film. It often, like the lyrics and, the, and like, the sound of the music doesn't match the scene. So I wonder if that had something to do with, you know, having to switch up the soundtrack at the last minute. Like, there, there's this... Art, I'd call it an art house strip show scene that's uh, cut, intercut with a slow mo sequence where Richard Rogers getting beat up in the back. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Which actually was kind of was very interesting. There was a lot of uh, detail went into that. That's a nice word, interesting. I mean, <laughs> it just feels uh, disjointed, mm. it's dry, sort of like halfway through. Shaft meets with like the main mafioso guy for like a fight. Like he's confronting him. Is that when he's making like shrimp Newberg? No, you know? he's window washing. Oh yes, yeah, okay. That scene where he's fighting the main guy, which we would think is like a big turning point in the film, that was like the most boring fight. Like no action, no sound. It was just dead air. Like sound comes at the end, like as the fight is dwindling down. Just yeah, I mean, I, it almost feels like everyone involved is just bored and over it. Like, well, it's yeah. like they made so much money, they have to, you know, they have to do a sequel. Sure, so. but I, I wouldn't be surprised to learn, like, if I researched further and heard some of the people involved with the production, that the production had some issues, mm. and maybe everyone was just trying to get it over with. Um, but yeah, this film is disappointing. Um, I know we're going to watch Shaft, Shaft go, in Africa. Shaft in Africa next, the third installment, which I feel obligated to watch now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have high hopes for it, um, but yeah, this one is disappointing. No, but there's a you know there, there's a lot of as with most black exploitation films, like some interesting supporting cast members show up. Like Moses Gunn is uh, second lead, I guess is the. Mafioso, bump, bumpus, bumpy, bumpy. Yes, yes. Uh, and the and the captain, the the, the police captain. Oh yeah, um, it looks like it should be called balling, balling, but captain. it's balling. Uh, that's Julius Harris, who is also in uh, quite a few films. Those two gentlemen, their acting ability far exceeds Richard Roundtree's. Um, yeah, well, and, and also the women. The portrayal of the women are is very. Um, 
you know, misogynist. Well, it, it's, well, it, it, yes, by today's standards, but I think for 1972. I don't know. Well, because after in the mid 70s, Pam Weir was the. Yeah, but if you think about how women like that were treated in other films in the same genre. I don't think they were. I don't I mean, know. The abuse towards them wasn't as. There's not one strong female in this. The the woman that does play his girlfriend is is painted as very dumb, uh, and she actually has a, a my favorite scene in Friday Foster. She she's involved in with her the kid, uh, but you know compared to like Chuck Turner with as the case where you have Michelle Nichols, this very strong, mouthy, uh, powerful woman, or sure. Willie, or Willie Dynamite, which you haven't seen. Uh, with, with the, yes, the women were not strong. No, not at all. For sure, like, for sure. This is just a weak, like weak characters. The dialogue is weak. It, there are moments when I think it's attempting to be humorous. Funny, yeah, it's not. When that falls flat, there are moments like you mentioned in one scene where they're at the like it's supposed to be like a gambling hall strip club. Yeah, um, like, it's, what's it called, Mother Ike's? I, think, I don't recall, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the 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 visuals are interesting, but it doesn't really match what's happening and why do we care? And the third, you know, speaking of the budget, they have a helicopter action sequence. The it, final sequence, yeah, it, it looks good. It looks very good. Uh, especially helicopter because explodes because if you remember, we had a, like a movie night for this a decade ago. Foxy Brown ends with a helicopter uh, sequence, but okay. it's real cheap. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this movie is definitely, I mean, I, you know, I often think, where did the money go? I can see that yeah. the money went into the production value. It does look good, but Richard Roundtree cannot support a production of this level. I think he needs to stick to, like, you know, what made him famous, perhaps. But, <laughs> or take some classes on acting, I don't know. But, uh, yeah. I've, I've seen worse. So, out of five stars, what would you give it? Like a, a one. I would give it a one. Yeah. Maybe. Well, I guess we get to watch uh, Shaft in Africa. Shaft in next. Africa. Yeah. It's two hours. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye.